So the Lenski experiment is often called like the you know best experiment that's done on evolution. It's definitely the longest experiment that's been done um, with evolution. And it's just, they've been watching E. coli for more than 30 years and watching how they change, um, you know, changing them from, you know, Petri dish to Petri dish and, and kind of watching the development. And there have been some changes. They, they uh, got better at metabolizing glucose. They, uh, you know, got bigger. Uh, And then there was one development in particular that was pretty astonishing. It was uh, the one population of the E. coli developed the ability to metabolize citrate, which was not uh, previously. And th- one of the questions I have, I'll ask later was about the anaerobic versus aerobic. But from what I understand, they could not metabolize citrate. And then they were able to metabolize citrate. And that was hailed as, see, we can develop new uh, I- abilities uh, through evolution. And this is a, you know, great success. It shows how evolution is able to change organisms to develop new abilities. What Scott Minnick did was he reproduced this with a slightly different variety of E. coli. And uh, he, within what took like 12 or 15 years uh, of evolution uh, in Lenski's lab, uh, Scott Minnick and his team were able to reproduce this in uh, just like a couple of months or less than a couple of months. So days to months rather than years. And he reproduced it again and again. So what it kind of showed was that E. coli, actually, it's not that hard to get them to develop this ability. Now, what's interesting is that uh, in this is where Sal, I'll ask you to correct me if I'm wrong. This is what I'm I'm checking against you to make sure I understand it properly. So what he was showing was that, you know, there are some things that are interesting about the development of the ability to metabolize citrate. It doesn't start as a natural ability, but it develops with a couple of things, gene duplication and then amplification. And there was one other thing that had to happen uh, within that to, to make the, the E. coli metabolize citrate, but he uh, was promoter able Promoter capture, promoter capture. Promoter <laughs> capture. Okay. So I don't know what that is. So maybe you can explain that sure. later. So, but he was able to consistently get the E. coli to develop that ability so is that really evolution? And, you know, what what Lenski's lab is pr- promoted when they when they said, hey, this is evolution is they talked about how this is like, I think they called it like contingent, historical contingent, where it was contingency. OK, so basically what Lenski's lab was saying is that it took many neutral mutations occurring before it was able to develop this ability. So the entire thing was based on um, the neutral mutations accumulating before the um, uh, mutation that allowed this thing to happen. And that is what is presented as the main way that evolution, uh, evolutionary change happens is that You've got neutral mutations that accumulate and they're supposed to, um, you know, eventually produce something good, which if that, if that's true, that is a big win for evolution, right? That's a demonstration of the power of evolution. But what Scott Minnick's team showed is that their E. coli did not have to undergo all of those neutral mutations. Their E. coli without those neutral mutations was still able to make this jump and, and do the gene duplication and everything required to metabolize the citrate. And it, so those neutral mutations that happened in Linsky's lab are irrelevant to the process. And so that's what I understood from that. Is that a good summary, Sal? 
Yes, that's a good summary of the 2017 presentation. I'm okay. privy to some stuff, which uh, Scott has written to me and said, I wish I had added these points more forcefully. Um, when Way back in 2017, before he had a back and forth with Len the man himself, Lenski, um, he didn't say certain things. But in the process of that, he's like, uh, he caught Lenski saying some things that, you know, Scott flipped back. There's a fun, I don't know how much, he, he said it's it's probably in his responses way back in 2017 or whenever he, he and Dusty did this. But he said he wish he, he emphasized the point more. Lenski picked the one strain of bacteria that was defective. That's why it took its 15 years. The more common wild type, I think it's E. coli K12. It's more representative of what's out there. If Lenski had picked that one, he would have been able to evolve this much quicker. Much quicker because it had more capability. What, and this is what I want to clarify with Dr. Minnick is that actually it had to break two, one or two more things to, to kind of compensate. And to get those mutations, that's why it took about 15 years. It, it took a while for it to, to, to actually break some things. And I, I have the email here where he actually describes, um, and, and he's pointed this out. He said he wrote this in in his responses. Uh, so this is this 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 is the picture I wanted to show. Okay, on the left is Zachary Blount, um, Lenski's uh, assistant. On the right is Dustin, or we call him Dusty. So Zachary Blount is Lenski's uh, author and assistant. And Dustin on the right is Scott Minnick's assistant. So it, it all those Petri dishes, those mountains of Petri dishes is how many, gener it kind of gives a feel for how many generations and how much effort and how many years they had to keep running this evolutionary experiment to get the feature. The main reason it took so long is uh, there was a defective E. coli. Uh, I, why don't I, you know, um, let me try to call up the actual name of it um, r rather than being vague. Uh, and Dr. Minnick has, has the uh, name here. Just give me one moment. Um, Let's see, the name of it is, <clears throat> the, it's DCUS, DCUS. Uh, Scott said, um, uh, Lenski used E. coli B, that's the name of the strain, and it could not grow uh, on something called sustenate, as a sole carbon source because it had a five pair deletion in DC US. And so to evolve this, it had to actually uh, kind of disrupt another gene called DCTA. And then it enabled the path. But if, if, if Lenski had chosen the more common E. coli, which is K12, K12 wild type, um, it wouldn't have taken 15 years to evolve this. So, the, okay, go ahead. And from what I understand, all of the changes that took place in the E. coli before the metabolized citrate, they were losses of genetic information and ability. And so, but, and then with regard to the, the, the change of the metabolizing citrate, it it's a it's a change that one could call it new information. But what Scott Minnick says is he doesn't count that as new information because it it's just a duplicate. It's gene duplication and ampli uh, amplification. But you know what evolution needs to show is that uh, like what we need to show for to make evolution a viable theory is that 
de- uh, this inform- information has to originate from somewhere. There has to be an, you know, some source of information for organisms where that, you know, then yeah, they can duplicate information, but where's the original source? And so that's what he's pointing out as one of the failures of this is that we're still not seeing new genetic information arising. Um, even if we, you know, look at what's happened in this experiment, it's, you know, still just a copying of information that was already there. Okay. So um, I'm going to deviate from some of the ID proponents and their standard line about information increase. Um, the way it's framed is like you're someone saying you can't win money in a casino. You can, uh, even if you're not a skilled gambler, uh, you can go in there. You might end up with a little bit more money in your pocket than you started with on one day. But over time, because of the law of large numbers, it's going to e- uh, erode unless you're a skilled gambler like I once was. Uh, but I got kicked out of the casinos because I was a skilled blackjack player. Um, so uh, I would I would not I'd be hesitant to say that there's never an in- information increase. Um, I would just say, OK, the first thing I'll point out, one of Lenski's lines started to lose genes. And I specifically asked Scott Minnick in that um, some people have that preparatory video. You'll see me way back in March 2017 when I was just a beginning biology student, even though I was already an engineer and physics student. I was beginning biology student. (laughs) And I asked him, what happens if you lose a gene? Can you recover it? Scott said, no, not unless you have other bacteria around that can kind of, you know, that have copies and you can have a horizontal gene transfer. Otherwise, it's gone forever. And so in one of Lenski's lines, I keep quoting this. It says, fitness increases despite sustained, uh, genome decays despite sustained fitness gains. Genome decays. Genome decays even by evolutionary standards. That is a loss of information. <laughs> You're losing genes. And I was just quipping. I said, okay. Uh, I said, Zach or anyone else? Um, and Zach is at the same university as Lenski. Um, not Zachary Blount, but Zachary Hancock, another Zach. So there are two Zachs at the University of Michigan. I, I said, Zach, how are you going to evolve a microbe into a human being when, when, when you increase evolutionary fitness by deleting genes? So I wouldn't necessarily hold up Lenski's long-term experiment. He has these citrate uh, mutants and some of the best performing ones are losing genes. So I say, okay, I'm going to grant you a fitness. I'm going to grant you information increase, but why don't you tell the whole story? You have a lot of lines that are just losing genes like crazy. They're reproducing like rabbits, really more like bacteria. Um, I'm, like rabbits is a figure of speech. They're just reproducing like rabbits um, and they're losing genes. So I mean, that's not very balanced to say you had information increase and then you ignore all the genetic losses in the line uh, in some of the lines you evolved. So um, I'm just going to just throw that point out. I'm willing to grant a little information increase, but over long term, I'd say it's going to be deterioration. We have evidence of that. I could not, I, I remember sharing this with people and they just started laughing. You know, people on our side of the argument, they're just laughing. I said, Lenski could not have delivered a better title for a paper because he was co-author of that paper. Genomes decay despite sustained fitness gains. I'm just like, okay, why don't you advertise that? How about a nice big breakthrough that you have an experiment that shows how natural selection accelerates genomic decay? I'm, I'm sure, I, I wonder how much press you're going to get over that. You have, you, you, you know, this is like the casino, the guy who lost all his savings, he's going to brag about the few times he won. <laughs> yeah, and the the thing that I noticed about that experiment is that I think it's at like 75,000 generations right now. I could be wrong, but I cuz I didn't look at the latest, but at least when you guys were talking, I think it was at 65,000. Yeah. So in that many generations, these small changes that have occurred. Now one could say, well, it's no longer an E. coli because it can metabolize citrate and that's what makes an E. coli an E. coli. 
but you've still got essentially the same organism. And so why is it that in this long-term evolution experiment, we can't get an organism to change more than in these very basic ways. And yet if we took, you know, 65,000, 75,000 generations of humans, and you try to think about the changes that would have to occur in humans in order to get, you know, the, okay, the, the last common ancestor or whatever, you know, if you think about the number of changes that would have to occur, it's like, wow, actually what this, uh, experiment is showing is that organisms are quite stable. And um, we see that all over and people don't want to talk about this, but you know, you've got organisms that you can find in the fossil record that are essentially the same as they were supposedly millions of years ago. And so, uh, you know, what about all the stability of organisms? That's, you know, where, where can we actually see these dynamic changes occurring in organisms. And, you know, we don't have the experimental evidence for it. So it probably should not be promoted as something that can happen if we have not had experimental evidence that shows it. Now, it's, you see, unfortunately, um, and this is something collectively myself, myself included, there are, if I said, hey, look, I, I can, I, I can, I can improve the performance of a car or I could change a car. I could just take a hammer and I'm going to hammer. And I could say, hey, look, I can, a hammer can change a car. Fair enough. But would you say the process of hammering the car is how the engine came about or all its novel innovations since the early cars? It's like, that's ridiculous. Right. There is a parallel. So, so I mean, the thing is, they can demonstrate one class of change. And I say class of change. You can't extrapolate that as showing that it's going to create other classes of changes. Okay, the obvious stupid stuff that I, I just can't believe no one's seeing this. You can't be deleting genes <laughs> saying, look at natural selection, deleting all these genes. It's so reproductively successful. Therefore, you're going to evolve a human. I'm just going to laugh. I'm really, you know, do you not see the problem? And I've cited many papers, the dominant mode of reproductive success is gene loss. It's not just restricted to bacteria, it's across all species. And like, guys, okay, that's your that's like a really basal problem. You can promote all your natural selection examples you want, but it's not exactly being genuine now if most of your explanations are gene loss or disruption. So you may not totally disrupt the gene, the, some other things you could do is alter it, weaken it. And that's why I was laughing. This book, this New York Times bestseller said, survival of the sickest. And I said, this is not what you want if you're trying to evolve complexity. Now, the problem with this E. coli experiment, it's more subtle. There's, there is a distinction between a promoter and a gene. A promoter. And yeah, a that's what I wanted to ask you to sure. explain. Can you explain and sure. show what happened? Okay. Mm -hmm. And anyone in the comment section, except the people I banned, I'm sorry, who I got fed up with, um, can correct me if I'm wrong. So I, this is just from a random Google search. I said promoter and gene. So just kind of the basics. The DNA provides a the gene part of DNA. So a lot of the DNA in a bacteria is genes. In humans, only like 2% of our genome is actual genes. So what is a gene? A gene generally, there's some kind of, you know, exceptions to this, but it generally is a, a template for a protein. In eukaryotes, it's more complex. It's a template for some <laughs> Excuse um, non-translated RNAs. We don't need to go there. Okay. But just think of just kind of like kind of the, the most basic central dogma of molecular biology, approximating it. The gene is what makes the protein. So when you say the SIT plus, you know, the, the SIT T gene, it's going to make the SIT T protein. It's the blueprint. The promoter, the promoter 
part. So this is all DNA. So, but there's a part of the DNA that's gene, part that's promoter, and part that's other stuff. The promoter region is um, that switches off whether it's going to express the gene because, like, um, there has to be a way for the the, the cell to say, look. I'm going to make this much. I need more of this kind of protein to build all my body parts. But when you make enough, you switch it off. So, um, so the promoter is basically the switch. So what can happen is um, what happens if you duplicate the promoter in a different region, um, you can actually, you can actually get it to, so there are certain conditions that will activate the expression of the gene. Do you have any questions here so far? Um, no, this is great. Okay, so if, if I disable the promoter region, for example, let's say I totally mess it up. So what happens in the promoter region is other proteins, first of all, have to dock, to dock there and say, okay, um, uh, the, the proteins decide whether, okay, if I dock there, I'm going to start the transcription. Or if I dock there, I'm going to inhibit it there's a whole orchestration right. of what happens, but all the computation will happen. So what, what'll happen is these molecular machines will assemble at the promoter region, and then they decide whether they're going to turn the gene on to start expressing or turn it off or block it. There's probably, I'm probably just totally messing this up. And um, this is a good Dr. Minnick uh, question is like, did, did I understand this? Um, and so what can happen is like, all right, let's say we accidentally copy this promoter region for that's associated one gene and copy it into a region this, you know, into a different gene area, in, into, uh, a, you know, into a different area. And now uh, all the machinery that was used to, to work with this gene is now going to be assembling to this other gene and it, it'll be turning it on and off. Um, so you could, it's basically switching the gene on and off. So it's very important then to make a distinction between um, making a new gene, copying a, copying a pre-existing gene, and then also the promoter regions. So um, I don't quite know, I don't have any analogies off the top of my head, but... Um, okay, but that repressor part that you showed, that that is like normal right within the process like there's a repressor to stop the copying when it needs to be stopped is that yes. correct yes okay. you can repress you can promote okay and it's kind of funny the repression happens in the promoter region <laughs> okay so there has been some, you know there's some evolution of terms that you know it just kind of got fixed so when you want to repress a gene you actually have to go to the promoter region and put a repressor machinery. So one of the things that will start transcribing the gene, and I could see it here, is this, R this RNA polymerase. It's a machine. And one way you could prevent it is you put in the promoter region, this repressor. It's another molecular complex. So um, the importance of the promoter region is it's like saying, hey, um, somehow the cell computed that we need more of this material. And that's still kind of mysterious how this is done. And it's, it's sort of simple, relatively speaking, in the bacteria compared to eukaryotes like humans. It's just insane. We can't, it's so hard to characterize. So the promoter region says, hey, I need more of uh, this particular gene. And it's like, well, you know, the machine will say, well, where will I find that gene? It's like, well, the promoter region has the sequence that's basically like an address. It's a postal address. So think of the promoter as the postal address. This is the area where you're going to regulate this gene. So promoter region is like an address. Okay. So what happened with the E. coli? So is it that they, okay, so there was a gene duplication and that duplication. was just accidental, as yes. far as we know. Or you, then, you can say, let's even say it's purposeful. It doesn't matter. It's, it duplicated it. Okay. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. Because could this be, since Scott Menick was able to reproduce it again and again, was it really accidental? Because, I mean. Okay. So, so, so okay. There's some 
And I'm happy to see this. There is some sympathy in the ID community that some mutations are directed. Even Dr. Sanford recently said they are now willing to say they, they think that sometimes an organism will actually try to reprogram its genome a little bit. There are limits to what it will can do. And I'm totally in favor with that. Um, there is kind of like a forbidden thing you do, do not do in computer science if you're a software developer is make self-modifying code, but you can do that. If you're a really gifted programmer, you could do that. So I think you can make, it's, I, I, you know, I hesitate to call it real information increase, but it's like, you know, look guys, I'm not, I'm not beyond the idea that genomes can actually learn from their environment. Our brains can learn, the genomes can adapt to their environment. God may have put some intelligence in it limited capability well we know learn. there's plasticity in other parts exactly. of organisms like there's plasticity even within the phenotype there's plasticity <laughs> you know i mentioned the the lizards and their sequel valves when they change their diet they get a new organ that pops up <laughs> and it's yes. like so yes. that's plasticity and then when their diet changes back to only vegetables or exactly. you know or to only meat then that um, you know, feature goes away. So that, you know, there's plasticity within organisms in other ways. So it makes sense there would be plasticity in the genome as well. So so that's why I'm kind of resisting. It's like, there's no information increase ever. I'm just like, no, I wouldn't go that far. You know, it's fine to duplicate a gene, but you've got you've got to get the original to come from somewhere. You've got, you've got to get the original. It's not going yeah. to do you any good if you're losing genes. <laughs> but um, Sal, can you clearly say what happened with the E. coli very like concisely? Like, so there was like, what happened with the promoter? Okay. What happened with the... All right. Uh, short answer, no. Um, short answer, no, because I'm struggling. It. You can um, do it. Okay. The short answer is not because... I'm normally long-winded and I can be concise. It takes a lot of effort, but I am a little bit concerned that I'm not even understanding this completely correctly, okay. but I will do my best. Okay. okay. I will do, I will do my best. So, so grace just, from the viewers, grace from the viewers. If Sal me. makes a mistake, we're happy to correct it. Okay. So this, this little MK, that's the original original uh, promoter region, MK. I wish they used different symbols, but basically this is a gene, Okay. that color, and then this is another gene. And these genes are side by side. And I think this is a RN something. I wish they didn't call it RNA. It could be another gene or something. That's what I need to ask Scott Minnick, or is that an MA? I think Looks it's like MA. N okay. And then this little gray box is the promoter, I believe. And I, th okay. this is why I have an issue with the diagram. And this is why it's, I'm gonna say, uh, Dr. Minnick, what is what here? Um, so we do have a promoter. And when- um, So it looks like the Linsky, I'm trying to figure out. So it looks like the bottom one is Linsky's. Correct. Long-term evolutionary experiment at the bottom. Right. And so the first one, that WT must stand for wild type. So that wild was type. what Minnick st started with. And then that's what Minnick got, I guess, the progression. Okay. That it's a little more now. subtle than that. Okay. It's a little more subtle than that. It turns out that it, for this section of the genome, and there's other sections that we're not showing, and that's very important. You could say that Lenski and Scott Minnick started with this, but there's a part of the genome he's not showing, which is that DCUS. Okay. Lenski started with a defective DCUS, which is not depicted here. So what, what Scott, what Dr. Minnick was pointing out is if you didn't have that defective part that Lenski had, all you really had to do is take this wild type and then you, you duplicate, you could see he puts a little promoter in here, this INSL1, and you could, that'll do it. Or uh, there's another one here where uh, he may put it here. Um, and he could explain this more in detail. But what wait, Sal, clarify, I need the clarification here. He can put it, 
but this is not happening by him putting things right. This is happening. It's just randomly happening. So right, I'll, I'll show right. you what's really embarrassing is that in one line, one line, uh, the promoter region ended up here. In another line, the promoter re region ended up here. And he had so many examples where it's just kind of, you you could be inserting these, um, redoing some of these promoter regions. And it was, it was giving you the same effect. So maybe one way to describe this is, is there, was there only one road to Rome or were there many roads to Rome? And it turns out there are many roads to Rome to get the same effect. Um, now this that, brings up another question really quick. This sit T section. Now it, what I was trying thinking I was understanding from the thing is that there was an ability to metabolize sit T in an anaerobic environment or it, it was it, was it possible okay. in either aerobic or anaerobic? It was possible to do it in an aerobic, aerobic, aerobic environment. But what they, what changed is that it had the ability to metabolize sit T in an anaerobic. anaerobic. Right. Okay. So it already had a capability. It just needed a little adjustment. Yes. Yes. Okay. And uh, uh, Dr. Minnick wrote me, he said, I want you to study that citric acid cycle because every creature can digest citrate, but you'll see, you saw it, him referring to it in that 2017. So even we humans at some point in our metabolic cycle have to deal with citrate. So it, it really didn't have, it wasn't that our body chemistry cannot handle citrate at all. It's the fact that um, when it's out in the environment to get it within the cell in a way that it can process, but, uh, but here it is, look, uh, most organisms have something called the citric acid cycle. Krebs uh, won the Nobel Prize. Took him a long time to figure out this. And you could clearly see it says citrate. What does this mean? The Krebs okay. cycle. <laughs> what does that mean? Oh, that my means goodness, nothing that... to me. I don't know what that means. Oh, okay. So why don't I read the, the Wikipedia article? <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. Okay. So I need to... two sentences. Two sentences. Okay. To metabolize our food, we need the citric acid cycle. Okay. That's it. For us so to- So the Krebs cycle oh, is the citric, part of the, citric part, acid cycle. Right. It's part okay. of, it's part, I hate to call it the di digestive process because some people anal in terms will say, well, that's not really it. I'm like, okay. Okay. You take in nourishment, you have to convert that food into usable stuff. Part of that involves- citrate being processed at some point you process okay. citrate at some point now there is some subtleties that dr minnick will point out you know as to you know you can't say we we don't deal with citrate even us even a bacteria that does not is not a, a site you know cannot live off of citrate it's still processing citrate it has a lot of capability to process citrate it, the, I think his point is it doesn't take really a lot. You just have to have the right switch. So that's what I was saying. I could move light switches and rewire. All right. Uh, you have all the machinery. You're just kind of crossing wires, so to speak. Okay. So what happened in the E. coli? There was a gene duplication. How did gene, that happen? When a, a cell is dividing, it has to duplicate its genome. So it has yes. to duplicate the entire genome. Sometimes in the process of duplicating the entire genome, it will duplicate individual genes, which is kind of interesting in and of itself. I need to point out one thing though. S Scott Minnick specifically pointed out when you have duplicated genes, that means it's having to copy more information. Do you remember the Spiegelman experiment where the genome kept getting smaller and smaller? Because yeah. okay, if you have Technically, if you have a duplicate of something, it's like, why would I have a million phone books? One will suffice, right? You're right. having, there's extra load. So he said specifically, gene duplicated genes are unstable. Mm. Uh, they could be selected against or, or uh, uh, drifted out. He didn't use the word drifted out, but I sort of think that's what he meant. 
So now they're not going to be as good at reproducing because now they have to reproduce more information. More, right. Yeah. Okay. So even just one extra gene, we, we think it's going to be hard for it to be stable in the population. Mm-hmm. And um, so uh, look, let's look at this diagram down here. This one right here. This is one of them. You can see it says CIT T. The little you have the you start with just one orange blob, which is mm-hmm. the CIT T gene. Now you have two copies of it. Okay, that's the gene duplication. And so, did it copy like all the other the CIT G, CIT T, M A? Like, was that all? Yeah, yes, but that was it, all part of the gene, the same right, gene. Right. It copied. Okay. You could see this is an entire duplication here. Okay. You could see like the the yellow. So it, uh, it duplicated the CIT G, the CIT T, this thing that's either MA or RNA, and then the MK, and then the YDR. Okay. And then, so what did he mean by it amplified it? Okay. Amplifying means if you have two copies, it's going to make, okay, if you have two copies of the gene, it's going to tend to make uh, twice as many copies of the protein. Okay. So it's the way the machinery, it's just the way the machinery works. Um, one way you can get, make more of something is to have more copies of it. That that's all it is. So oh, gene, okay. So it's not a second thing that happened. It's just that's what correct. naturally comes from the duplication. Correct. Correct. So we do know um, it seems one of the natural adapt. Uh, okay, I'm going to be a little philosophical here. One of the ways that I think the designer has enabled creatures to adapt is that if they really need something, you know, why don't they just have more duplicates of the gene? Uh, we could either, okay, so maybe as an analogy, okay, so when when you have like a, a speaker um, on, you know, um, and it's certain loudness and you just crank up the volume, you can adjust it within the range of that speaker. But if you really want more loudness, you get two speakers or more. It's it's really not very sophisticated. I mean, it's, it's it, conceptually, it's not. It's kind of the same thing there. Um, there might be a point you could, you know, it's just going to be, uh, you can make much more of the protein just by having a duplicated gene. So it's kind of like an extra speaker um, to amplify. So that's all it is. He said that's really the first step. And it does help it a little bit. And then there's a phase where there's a, a this promoter capture. It's really more of like rewiring. And a promoter, again, that is a duplication event. That is not, okay. And, and maybe one thing to bear in mind, and I'll, I'll show this diagram again. When we're duplicating parts of the genome, um, and we just happen to take a piece here and then duplicate it elsewhere. That, um, that's not as that is not as fantastic as actually creating a new gene. And that's why when I debated Aaron Ra and I said, "Look," uh, and he said, "There, you know, there's no effing common ancestor of all proteins." Uh, it's very much difficult to just take an arbitrary sequence and just start to create a new protein family. Um, and I tried to show that diagrammatically. It's not very hard by comparison to duplicate pieces here or there. If you have a copy error, you could just like say, oh, uh, like in this case, you see it says the tandem duplication, 5,834 base pairs. So that's 5,834 DNA elements. We call them base pairs, but um, that's how many letters of DNA just got duplicated. That's not really particularly spectacular. If I were to modify, if I wanted to say, like, say, make a topi summarize from scratch, I would have to have first start off with a string that would be, say, 4,500 DNA elements. And then I would have to modify each and one of those individually. Then I could make a brand new topi summarize. This is copying something that pre-exists versus, you know, modifying 14, you know, 4,500 nucleotides to make a new gene. That is, that, that is. Okay. That's orders of magnitude more difficult. So now let me give you some of my closing thoughts. Okay. 
there is some okay the first interpretation that bothered me in 2017 i'm like this is very interesting that you could do this faster than Lenski. but my first reaction was dr minnick i don't know that we've necessarily broken it because you could show this could evolve so much faster so you've actually helped the evolutionary case because you could show you've shown that it's really easy to evolve this um and therefore you know we're just going to multiply Lenski's argument by that, you know, many factors. You were able to do this 300 times faster than Lenski or whatever factor. And and now you've just kind of improved his argument because you're showing E. coli can evolve. You know, it does speed it up, but is it relevant to the evolution of new genes? Because this is just, you're duplicating genes and you're, cat, you're rewiring the promoters, which is the switches on and off. That is trivial compared to being able to build a new gene family. And unless someone has actually worked with this a lot, uh, it's hard to convey that to someone who hasn't. But uh, I think Dr. Minnick's colleague could see this as a problem. I could tell you this is not, I can almost guarantee that Joe DeWeese, who's Mr. Topoi Somrace in the ID community, will say uh, gene duplication is not going to make a Topoi Somrace if it didn't pre exist. Um, yeah. You, you can't use a process of duplication to make um, a gene of that level of complexity. Uh, that that would be just absurd. And I would have to agree, but it's like, unless you actually know the structure of um, real, you know, novel proteins it, uh, to the outside world, this looks like, well, it's all the same thing. It's like, no, no, it's not. It's not. Um, so that's the first thing I'd say. The, the second thing, and I've been saying for a long time, uh, Lenski's crowing about this new species he's created. If you throw it out in the wild, where it had to compete against bacteria, other bacteria, it's going to die. It's going to go extinct real fast. I'm like, um, I could. Why see would it go extinct if it was subject to other bacteria? Uh, it's very fragile. Uh, okay, well, not. Uh, it's lost a lot of ability. Uh, so, um. I think he, he he said, okay, um, what Lenski evolved is like evolving poodles and chihuahuas. And he throw it in an arena where there are coyotes and wolves and foxes. Um, it's, it, I mean, that's the analogy. So, so those yeah. are more capable of, so, so that I would say it's the durability and ability to, you know, um, real bacteria have, a lot more in their arsenal to be able to cope with all these environments. This E. coli can only live in that environment. It cannot live in a real environment. It's it's so specialized. And obviously, if, if it's been losing genes, it's definitely specialized. Well, to me, it's not really a valid criticism okay. because the whole point is to show the process of evolution and like how something can change within a selected environment. So what I'm trying to say is, yeah, okay, that bacteria may not survive if we just throw it back out into another environment. But if it is, if it, you know, if it is making uh, positive changes in the environment that it's in, then that's a valid, uh, you know, argument for the evolutionary side. Do you see what I'm saying? I think you made a very good point there. Um, so I, I, I that didn't occur to me. I I, I do know that we got um, there. There's some chuckling when we, we we talk about like okay, this is Chihuahua versus coyotes. You know, I'm just like, well, that is kind of cute, but you have a point. So um, I, I think uh, I I don't know how to handle that except that um, I mean, for me person, okay, just at, at personal level, like. To me, Lenski just created this artificial environment where you created a creature that uh, it really isn't going to survive in a real environment. Um, and we, we do want to talk about real environments. Um, and and I, I think we could actually say that in real environments, there are probably, we could imagine an E. coli evolving citrate utilization. We can, that's a good, that's a good Scott Minnick uh, question. 
because he did point out the bacteria strain that um, Lenski started with was already defective. It 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 had a disrupted DCUS gene, and I don't know he knows what the terms are for that. Um, and it really really is like I said, that's the first big mistake. It's kind of embarrassing. He was crying that this is oh now going back to Lenski's claim, this is all contingent. And, and I wish that word wasn't used because it's con confusing. Yeah. Uh, and it's from Stephen Gould. But what it's saying is it depends on so many. There's only one road to Rome, so to speak. And it depended on all these sequence events just happening just, just right. And it turns out there are many roads to Rome. Be because what Scott Minnick evolved in those 47 trials each of them is different but it's getting the same outcome this is kind yeah. of funny where you could have multiple recipes to end up with the same cake uh, in practice right. that doesn't happen but in the bacteria it's like well you know uh, you and what that tells you is this isn't that rare and maybe it's not that complex because there are many ways to make a, uh, i can make a paperweight i could take right. So many random objects in my house and make them a paperweight. It's not that difficult. And by way of analogy, there's so many ways to 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 do this. It's like, well, did you really create something that was that spectacular if there's so many ways to do it? This is not much more than kind of trying to make a primitive hammer out of a variety of rocks. It's not that hard. And so this is a little bit, I think, in that regard, uh, it does show how evolutionists will hype something that is really of no significance and pretend they've made some great discovery and vindicated evolutionary theory, and it's nothing of the sort. And I think you said it, and I think Scott Minnick said it, that there's a limit to what can happen, right? Like there's a limit to the progress or change that an E. coli can have. And so, you know, they've been able to show this in repeated experiments, but you know, where are the other capabilities that would need to evolve if we're going to go from prokaryote to eukaryote and to the diversity of life that we see? We need it to be able to break limits. We need it to be able to break through um, beyond the these this basic change, and that's what we don't see. Well, well, you know, there's something I just observed in this. I, I mean, we can clear it with Dr. Minnick. All of this is just copying what already exists. Even that promoter capture is a copy. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I think you had a good instinct. How can you really make something, you know, the kind of novelty you need is not copying what you already have. <laughs> maybe we could just, maybe that would be the bottom line. We'll say Dr. Minnick, um, yeah, I, even I'm willing to grant this is a spectacular new cape, a spectacular adaptive capability. But this is done just by copying. You can't, one cannot extrapolate that you copied something and even copied it in quote unquote the wrong places. Therefore, that means you could build brand new genes with new capabilities of like say collagen, um, helicase, polymerase, whatever. It's, it, it's, I think we could run that by him. I would like yeah. to just hear it from him if this is mostly just copying the same stuff. I mean, it is kind yeah. of interesting. You can have all these capabilities by copying a little bit more of this or that, but I don't think that that's, that can solve the origin of new genes. Yeah. Now, although we've been kind of being critical of the Lenski experiment, I want to echo what Scott Minnick said in that talk, because he actually said this was a good experiment. Lenski, Lenski's experiment was a good experiment. And we probably should have said this to beginning the beginning of the show. If you want to show that evolution happens, this is the type of experiment that you should be doing. And it's so we commend, you know, Dr. Lenski for doing this experiment yes. and for, you know, showing these results because you know, this is the type of thing that needs to be done more. And, you know, this is, yeah. So I just, we, I don't want to hate too much on the Linsky experiment. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And, uh, and Scott Minnick said the same thing. So. One thing that was impressive, he said, okay, in, in, if you were to like, say, try to 
analogize this or extrapolate it to humans, this would be like 1.3 million years of yeah. And and some people on our side of the argument have said, well, uh, look, they, they even in 1.3 million years, you haven't created a new gene equivalently and 10 to the 11th power of human beings. Uh, yeah. This is, this should be very concerning. <laughs> um, and, and, and so we have these projects called orphan gene projects where we could have thousands. I mean, if we evolve from a common ancestor, this is going to be very problematic. We actually don't know how many orphans uh, of, you know, significance we have. But even a few would be very, very difficult 